Welcome to um, the plenary session called The Ecosystem of ORCID, ETDs, and Research Activities, including ORCID's role in ETDs and enabling open research with Shauna Sadler from ORCID. And ORCID and ORCID and Embargo Options, Do Students Make the Connection? with Kelly Flannery Rowan from Florida International University. My name is Cynthia Tindongan. I'm at Ohio University in the Graduate College, and I'll be your moderator for the next 40 minutes. A quick reminder before we begin, during the presentation portion, please keep your mics or phones muted. Please feel free to use the chat feature to pose questions, which will be addressed during the Q&A. And I have in mind that each of the presenters would present a, around 15 minutes each and then 10 minutes for Q&A, if that is all right with you. Uh, but we'll just sort of keep track of how, how things are going and what is in the chat. So welcome everyone. And now we'll turn it over to Shauna Sadler first. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Okay. I'm just taking over the screen share. Great. Great. Well, thank you, Cynthia. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the nice introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see you again. <laughs> uh, my name is Shauna Sadler. So I'm the engagement manager for the Americas and the Caribbean. So Canada, US, Latin America, and the Caribbean. It's just, it's a fantastic job. I just get uh, such a kick out of it. It's get to meet so many interesting people like we have here today. Um, so ORCID has been around for almost 10 years and I'm guessing everybody's heard of ORCID, um, but what we do and how it relates to AT ETDs may not be clear to you. So that's why I've written the presentation today, hopefully to uh, make ORCID a little bit more clear for everyone. And then after Kelly's presentation will be available for questions. And of course, please feel free to reach out to me um, if you have any more questions. Okay, so let's get started. ORCID, what on earth is ORCID? It is a bit of an abstract concept. So ORCID's vision is a world where all who participate in research, scholarship, and innovation are uniquely identified and connected to their contributions and affiliations across time, disciplines, and borders. So in short, what this means is that ORCID is part of an infrastructure to organize scholarly activities. So we provide a unique ID to people. This ID then connects the researcher's scholarly activities to their ORCID record, ensuring the right author gets credit for their work. The person can be anywhere, anywhere in the world, and in any discipline. So ORCID provides three specific services. So first is the unique ID that I mentioned. These are usually issued to people who are researching, so either graduate students or researchers, and we're finding more people in research administration are also getting ORCID IDs to, be, to help be part of the process. Second, we provide a record with each unique ID so people can document their research activities. And then third, ORCID provides an infrastructure to share this data with other systems in the scholarly communications ecosystem. So while ORCID is free for individuals to use, um, as a global nonprofit organization, ORCID is sustained by membership structure for organizations interested in using the ORCID registry, which I will get into in a minute. Okay, so now let's take a look at how, or how ORCID can work for graduate students. So to demonstrate how ORCID works for grad students and researchers, we have here Sofia Maria Hernandez Garcia to demonstrate. So please imagine Sofia is a grad student at your organization. So Sofia went to our website, ORCID.org, clicked on sign in register link, and spent approximately a minute registering for an ORCID ID. So this is the 16 digit number that you see on the screen ending in 2427. And this number is unique to Sofia. So when Sophia signed up for an ORCID ID, she was assigned this record to capture her research activities. So I'd like to point out a few key sections of this record. Um, so first on the left hand side, we provide the researcher the opportunity to share information about themselves and how they relate to the research community. On the right hand side, the researcher can list information about themselves, such as their biography, their current and past employers, where they received their education, where they're currently studying, um, such as your institution. So I put this slide in just a little bit um, with the, um, we have a one section of the ORCID record where you, 
awards can be recognized. And so in Joan Lippincott's presentation, she was talking about the Three Minute Theses Award. And uh, we do have some um, universities and graduate associations who uh, host the 3MT, three, the three and they're looking to write the 3MT to the winner's ORCID records. And it'll recognize their university as the host of the 3MT or their association. So it's just something to think about and keep an eye on. So this is, um, it, uh, awards are recognized as distinctions in the ORCID record. It's a really broad phrase because we, we try to be all inclusive, but I just thought I'd quickly mention that for everybody who, who might be hosting the 3MT. Um, so the most popular section of an ORCID record is the work section. Um, so this is where a researcher lists their scholarly output, including their thesis or dissertation. And so we do capture, we do have a schema and there is a specific field for theses and dissertations that can be identified. Um, other forms include journal articles, book chapters, and we support listing all forms of scholarly output. So as Joan was saying earlier, scholars and grad students are doing amazing work and the, the outputs are incredible and they're creative and ORCID supports all forms of them. Uh, we just what really helps is when that output has a DOI, a digital object identifier, so that you can put that link in the ORCID record, and then that is that clear you know, link to that object, that digital object, no matter what form it is, text or graphic or what have you. Okay, so let's quickly review the benefits of ORCID for grad students. Okay, normally grad students are at the start of their research career, and it's ideal for them to get their ORCID ID early in their career so they can begin building their ORCID record from the start and they don't have to retroactively add their content later, which is a real pain. So graduate students are usually looking to establish themselves as researchers. Getting an ORCID ID is a great start. So it's important for grad students to know this ID will be with them for the rest of their careers. Uh, the more they use it, the more useful it will become. When they submit a manuscript with their ORCID ID, the publisher will publish their ORCID ID along with a paper, giving them credit for this publication. The publisher will then write the citation to the student's ORCID record on behalf of the student. And the same goes for funding agencies. When they apply for research funding, there will be um, often an option or sometimes a requirement to include an ORCID ID. And Adrian Ho, um, who was presenting just before me, mentioned that in his presentation. Uh, so at the moment in the US, the NIH, uh, all trainees are required to have an ORCID ID when they apply for funding or any of the training. And uh, we've been in touch with the NIH and continuing to work with them and their ORCID um, adoption is continuing to grow and develop. So I think that's something just to be aware of and prepare for. Okay, and when students log into, um, into a system with their ORCID ID, the content that's already in their ORCID record will pre-populate the form that they're logging into. So if it's a funding form that requires their biography, all of their work section will carry over and pre-populate for them. So it reduces the administrative effort of the researchers, which of course they, they don't want to uh, retype or re-enter the content. Um, and some of the core values of ORCID is that we value efficiency and trustworthy data. So we've created this short animation uh, using Sophia, because she's so great, um, to explain the benefits of ORCID to the individual researcher. I'm, I'm not going to play it now, but I do suggest watching it as a follow-up video. It's a charming animation. Um, if you just, if you Google uh, what is ORCID, this video usually pops up to the top of the results and it's easy to find and uh, hopefully share with your colleagues. Okay, so we've talked about ORCID for individual researchers and graduate students. So now we're going to shift and we'll talk about ORCID for organizations. So there are three key groups when we think about the benefit of ORCID for research organizations. So first on the left is the graduate student or researcher with an ORCID ID and a record full of their scholarly activities. So second in the middle is the ORCID registry. So this is a big database. Um, this is ORCID's infrastructure that holds the ORCID records and IDs. So currently we have just over 9.5 million of these records and IDs uh, from scholars around the world and in every discipline. Um, and the third on the right is your organization and whichever platform you use to organize the information about graduate students or research activities at your institution. Um, some names of these systems are student management systems, repositories, research management systems, and of course, ETD systems. So ORCID has built an infrastructure where the data about these 9.5 million researchers can be shared with other organizational systems. 
So when an organization gets membership with ORCID, the organization can pull data from ORCID to populate your local system. So this can be done on demand or set up to enable auto update, giving administration access to real time accurate data. So you'll notice the arrows go both ways in this diagram. With organizational membership, organizations like yours can write to researchers records. So this helps the researcher maintain accurate data in their ORCID record, which is used to populate forms, such as funding applications and manuscript submissions with publishers. Um, there is one feature that I've heard from grad schools that they value, and that's the ability to call or like pull the data from ORCID um, about their current graduate students and alumni. So stepping back and looking at ORCID's role in the research, ORCID, the research ecosystem, we see the researchers at the center of it all with interdependent relationships with funding agencies, publishers, and their institution. ORCID provides a unique identifier for the researcher. They can be clearly identified and given credit for their research activities. So again, you'll notice there's a two-way arrow representing data flowing between ORCID registry and other stakeholders, such as funding agencies and publishers. So automating the data to flow freely from the source of the data to the other stakeholders allows for accurate data to populate our systems and minimize burden on researchers and research administrators. So the ORCID registry is a hub that enables data to flow efficiently. Okay. So let's quickly review the benefits of ORCID for graduate school administrators. Um, to keep things, I guess, simple, if just imagine that your graduate school, there's a policy and all your graduate students have an ORCID ID, then the graduate school could then get data from the ORCID registry for, for rep reporting purposes. That was hard to say, reporting purposes. <laughs> You can see which of your grad students have published and received grants. And then after graduation, you could get data about your alumni to see if their research publications of funds have, have continued to grow over time. You may want to reconnect with them and celebrate their success as one of your alumni. It's hard to get data about alumni, isn't it? It's tricky. So uh, the ORCID registry is one way you could do that. Okay, so quickly, uh, benefits for, uh, of ORCID for librarians and archivists. Uh, the ORCID ID is a unique identifier, that's clear. Uh, so the works are attributed to the right author. And, you know, from prag pragmatic experience, I mean, I used to be an ETD administrator as well. And I remember looking at the collection and there would be multiple common names. And I wasn't sure which work the author, which work belonged to which author. And so this is what the problem that ORCID solves. Um, so the unique ID also supports researchers who change their name for whatever reason without repercussions to their career. So um, in the presentation that Kent State uh, did a little while ago, they referred to this in their records. Um, you know, it's a bit of an issue when um, authors change their name. And so when you remove the name itself and you'll only give them a unique ID number, um, it really does help with this, this issue. And, and we've, all, we've all met the researchers who, you know, sometimes they'll get married and change their name or they decide, you know, for uh, maybe gender identity purposes, change their name as well. So, um, if they have an ORCID ID, that issue is removed and they don't have any academic repercussions with their, uh, for, um, with their academic uh, rec record of work. Shauna, yes. I, I'm, I'm letting you know that you're just about out of time. If you need another minute or so, I think that okay. would be fine. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then just for all the librarians out there, all the uh, data in the ORCID record has three privacy settings. You can set each line item of data to fully public, only for trusted organizations, the researcher decides, or private. So there's a lot of US, US universities doing some great work with ORCID right now uh, with different policies and different levels of integration with their ETD systems. Um, you know, I'll share my slides so you guys can read these, go through them later if you like. Um, I also just wanted to point out that the, some of the U.S. funding agencies, uh, you know, if a graduate student receives funding from a, a government agency, sometimes there is a requirement that the agency also get a copy of the research. And so this is an example of the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, they do require um, the deposit of the thesis or dissertation, and they do assign an ORCID ID as part of the process. And so here's an example record of one of the DOE uh, theses in their collection, the e-link collection. So just some stats for you guys, Shana, if you... Sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off. I'm sorry. All done? Okay, so there we go. Thank 
Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. We're ready for Kelly Flannery Rowan. There you are. Thank you. All right. Um, there we go. I think I'm unmuted. If you can all hear me, right? All right. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some research that I've been doing that kind of follows, um, you know, an orchid on what Shauna has been talking about. Um, and so, uh, I am the one at my institution who uh, publishes all the ETDs um, into our digital commons repository. And so we, we, um, we put in an ORCID uh, box about, I feel like it's like five years. I've been collecting stats maybe for five years on that at FIU, four or five years. Um, and so over time, because I track it, I've, I've noticed that some people will embargo clearly because they intend to publish, but they won't create an ORCID. And then other people will create the orchid, um, you know, and I'm assuming, okay, these people want to publish, you know, and um, or plan to publish, and then they don't embargo, which, you know, that's not as confusing. They may be open access publishing, but it's that, that first group of people that really made me wonder what's going on. Are they connecting, like, what orchid is? What is the point of orchid? What is the point of embargo? are they seeing how these two things work together? So I sent out um, surveys to every single person who submitted an ATD um, and pretty much the questions are the same. You know, um, I didn't ask you why you created an orchid if you didn't, I asked you why you embargoed. <laughs> so that would be the difference. I either asked you whether why you embargoed or why you create an orchid. So um, the surveys are about the same. Um, and so I was just going to show you some of those results and, and some of the things that surprised me. So ORCID, um, I'm going to start with the people who did both an ORCID and Embargo. First of all, interestingly, these were all PhDs. None of my master's students um, did both an ORCID and an Embargo. Um, so this is a little surprising for me that 45% of the people already had an ORCID. Um, that was fascinating, uh, just because I have no idea how active the faculty are or how knowledgeable the faculty are with ORCID and how much they're sharing it with their students. So that was nice to see. 21% um, intended to publish, 12% said that a publisher requested it. So we're really seeing, over time, we're seeing growth in publishers requesting it. 6% um, created an orchid just because it was there and they thought it was required. So yay, what, you know, um, that's gonna happen. Um, now, uh, they all, these are the people who also embargoed our PhDs. So 68%, I asked them why they embargoed, 68% thought it was necessary for publishing. And this is something we've already talked about during this conference is trying to support and encourage open access. So we see that our departments are not teaching anything about open access, um, you know, because people are still, this is what they're learning. So um, another 16%, their department encouraged them to embargo. 12% um, a publisher did request it. Um, and 4% are unhappy with their research. Um, and that happens more often than you think. Um, it used to be in the past, uh, as we were doing our RTDs, our retrospective theses, um, people would tell us not to put it up because they said they were unhappy with their research. And then we would find that it was actually before turning it in, the whole thing was plagiarized. So there's less of that now. Um, all right, so here's the group that really interested me. The, I created an ORCID, but I didn't embargo or I embargoed and I, I didn't create an ORCID. So I just wanna know what's going on in their minds. So for the people that chose not to embargo, so these are people who created an ORCID but chose not to embargo. They, uh, this was a nice surprise too, right? So 46% want their research to be freely available, yay. 29% intend to publish and want their research discoverable, fantastic. 10 people maybe, I guess the question, the option, the answer was found no reason to embargo. So maybe they don't know what embargo is. Perhaps that question should have been more specific. Um, now, out of these responses, 65% already had, um, parts of their thesis or dissertation published elsewhere, which is interesting, and they still wanted it open. So maybe they, 
they could have been working on a grant or a patent or something from the government or just have been really up on open access. I don't know. Um, and 86% of those people were, um, were PhDs. Okay, so why did you choose to embargo? So these are the people who didn't create an ORCID, but went ahead and embargoed. And 58% of those people plan to publish. So why didn't they create an ORCID? Um, so that was my, that's my big question. Um, so they embargoed because they figure they're going to publish, um, or 14% that, again, their department's telling them to. Um, another 9% thought it was required, and that was actually probably from the department to or colleagues. Um, and of course, we have the smallest percentage, we have those people who are just unhappy with their work. So I put these side by side. So like, why did you create an ORCID and why did you choose not to? So again, with this group, this is not that first group, uh, but this is the group of doing one or the other. 43% um, already had one again. Um, and the others did it because they intend to publish. And another 13% because a publisher requested it. And another 8% they heard a publisher rule required or someone in the department recommended. So it really is word of mouth. They're hearing about, uh, they're creating their ORCID because they're hearing about publishers requiring it, publisher, publishers requesting it. Okay, and the last one, I thought it was, I think it's the last one. I have these little windows are everywhere. Okay. Um, I thought it was a good idea whether I publish or not. Um, and we grabbed one person who said, I thought it was required, so. Okay. <laughs> um, I used to say, well, if you're never gonna publish, if you're literally never going to publish, you're, you're just, you, you just squeaked by through this degree and you just wanted to be over, then creating the ORCID wasn't, eh. But what I've realized over time is we have had some cases of students that had, we have one case, sorry, don't want you to think there's hundreds. Uh, there's one case of a student who had the same name as a terrorist. And so maybe this is a really good idea whether you're not going to publish or ever, because there's a reputation too. So, but someone talked about that in a previous, uh, previous session about your, your academic reputation. So maybe even if you're never going to publish, but this one thing's out there, it's a good idea to have an ORCID just to avoid that kind of confusion. Um, and so the people who didn't choose an ORCID did not know what ORCID was, which is kind of what I figured before the research started, that there was some, I don't know what ORCID um, is, but almost an equal amount just because I didn't require it. It wasn't required. Um, so that's something to think about because I'm seeing from this uh, conference today, you know, some privacy uh, restrictions in place that might make that work. Um, I didn't notice the ORCID field, which is really weird because we have a huge box for ORCID. It's almost more confusing because you're like, what goes in this huge box? Um, so I have to look at that again. <laughs> I didn't think it was important and I didn't have time which tells me they didn't read the graduate school manual because it says it takes about 60 seconds. So, all right, so in summary, um, our PhDs understand ORCID and the departments are educating about embargo and ORCID, whether or not they're educating correctly about embargoes, another conversation. So what we did find though, is that master's students are not getting the same education on these topics that our PhDs are. Um, and we're seeing, and I'm obviously seeing a lot of continued growth in uh, publishers and other people, you know, expecting an ORCID. So surprises for, for me. So the worst one was that my survey actually caused people to go back and embargo. And they wrote that in the survey. Well, after doing this, I've embargoed. I'm like, oh. So I was gonna do this study for three semesters and I decided two is enough <laughs> before I force anybody else into embargoing. Um, Far more students, this is surprising for me, far more students are aware of ORCID uh, than I thought. Uh, so that's great news. Um, not having enough time to create an ORCID, like I said before, I think that's just a clue that they didn't read the manual. Um, just missing the ORCID field. I don't know how they're doing that either. Like I said, big, huge box, but I'll look at that again. Um, I was kind of surprised that 40% don't know what ORCID is. Oops, I'm so sorry. Um, I think that's just a case again of not reading, not reading the handbook. Um, but surprisingly, 75% wanted to share their research, of those that, you know, did not embargo, wanted to share their research, which I thought was great. 
And finally, my last slide, um, these are things that I think from my research that we've learned and that we can maybe address. And I would love to hear from people if you have dealt with any of this, if you have solutions that have worked. Uh, we obviously need to reach our master's students better. Um, maybe we need more ORCID signage in the library. I'm thinking like at the checkout desk, the reference desk, maybe more of this. I assume it's part of our first year experience. Our reference librarians are great, but I feel like it's something I should check on um, and see what's happening. Uh, we will likely not require ORCID, but after today's conference, I may take another look at that. Um, and then make ORCID feel more visible. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I'll take a look at that. <laughs> um, find a better way to share the brevity of signing up, right? So these are people who didn't, obviously didn't read the graduate uh, manual on this, on this particular subject or the lib guide that we have up. So uh, maybe we have an ORCID sign up event. I, if you guys have suggestions, throw them in the chat. I will get to them as soon as I'm done here. Um, and then just better education about open access for the students and the faculty, right? And so um, it's, it's really not that difficult. So FIU does have a strict open access policy, like try to publish an open access first, but just this month, me and my two co-authors um, actually published in a journal that is not open access, but I simply wrote an email and said, hey, we have a strict open access policy here. Can I put a preprint up? And he's like, sure not that hard so um you know i know some people are going to be stickier about that you know but that's maybe we just need to do some education on that and of course the citation benefit that comes with oa which benefits the students first and foremost but also the university right so um so i feel we could probably do some more education on that and um this is that's my research in a nutshell. Um, we have Shauna's information up here in case you'd like to contact her. You have mine and Shauna included Shayla uh, Rabin, um, who is the US Orchid Consortium lead, um, in case you wanna contact anybody. And we are open to questions if we have time. It looks like we have one question in the chat. Does the institution need to have an institutional membership to access grad student data? Uh, so, there's a few points to that. So if the graduate student has made their data publicly available, uh, the university can use ORCID's public um, API to pull that data, to call that data. Um, but if there's any, um, this, the other uh, setting that a graduate student can use is, um, it's called trusted organizations. And so when you're a member organization, which in the US is 4,300 a year through the US consortium, um, then you would be able to, with membership, call the trusted organization data. And so what we often find is a lot of graduate students and researchers will make their works publicly available, but, available, but the funding section will often be only to trusted organizations because they don't want to tip their hat to the people they're competing against for those research funds, uh, but they do want to make it available to their institution so they can report it to whoever they are um, you know, reporting to. Thank you. Someone asked, would you allow retroactive embargoes on theses? This is to everyone. Uh, would you allow retroactive embargoes on theses? And there, there's one response. We require ORCID accounts for all students who are required to provide a thesis or dissertation. This is managed via ProQuest. So I don't know if others have comments on that, if they would allow retroactive embargoes or if um, Kelly or Shauna want to speak to that. Sure. Um yeah, we, they can, if they, if a student graduates and they didn't embargo something, or they embargoed it and it ran out after two years, but then they get a publishing contract and someone's like, no, you can't have your thesis up, um, they can come back and, and we will put a, an embargo on it at that point for a specific amount of time. And then in an ORCID record, uh, it would be the researcher or the grad student that, who would go into their um, ORCID record and manage that themselves. They could, they have full control themselves. Thank you. I, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Would anyone like to? Uh, maybe just to pick up on something Kelly was talking about at the end when it's time to um, 
um, promote ORCID at your, um, at your institution. Uh, we do have uh, graphics available, um, some fun posters, and then we also, um, you know, to members, uh, I've got a couple here, we often send out uh, ORCID pens, and let me see if I can find them. We have these, these are really popular these ORCID stickers that people, grad students put on their laptops, they're quite hot. So if you're, if you're an ORCID <laughs> member, or you're considering and you'd like some, just let me know and I can get some sent out to you. I am definitely going to be in contact again, Sean. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, other questions or comments? Um, here's one that says, um, Let's see, I, I'm, uh, I'll have to go back in the thread a little bit. Um, lots of our embargoes are because of patent filing, so we're very careful with those. Um, and then someone else says, but what's the point? Once they're out there and indexed by search engines, it is final. It, it is findable, searchable, I guess. Um, and then someone else says, but doesn't the ORCID record direct back to either the institutional IR or ProQuest? I get sometimes requests from students whose embargoes have expired and they want to extend them. And I will do that. I, it might be kind of pointless, but uh, I will go ahead and do that. Others? Uh, so just quickly to clarify the ORCID record, um, it depends on the data that is put into ORCID. So we, we think of ORCID as the secondary host, host of citation data, uh, not the primary. So your repository would be the first, the primary, and then whatever data you submit or the researcher submits to their ORCID record. And so that um, there's a manual entry. So if they just want, uh, you know, some data, but not all of it in their ORCID record, that we, we support that, no problem. Great. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, someone asked here, you mentioned administrators setting up ORCIDs. So does it make sense to have an ORCID number if you're not, if you've not authored work? If you're an administrator, uh, what, what you can do is if you get an ORCID ID, um, a researcher can uh, go into their settings and assign you as a, a trusted individual so you can manage their ORCID record on their behalf. And so you'll be required to have an ORCID ID. Uh, we do that just so we can track in the logs, um, who has done what. So when the researcher comes to us and says, who did this to my record? We can look in our logs and say, oh, is this person that you gave trusted individual status to, they did this work. And so just, just so we can make sure that the data in the ORCID records are, we maintain that trust and a high level of quality, it's important to us. That makes great sense. Thank you. What other questions? Shauna or Kelly, do you have more comments? We've got, we've got some more time here. I'm sorry I cut you off, Shauna, when, uh, <laughs> when we have more time at the end. <laughs> I think I was just going to talk about, you know, the impact that ORCID has with some of our statistics. So I mentioned that we're uh, currently at 9.5 million people um, who have ORCID IDs, and we're expecting about two weeks that it'll hit 10 million. Uh, ORCID IDs that have been issued. So just to talk about the scale of it. And, uh, uh, and I talked about organizations that write to ORCID records. So uh, it's mostly the publishing industry uh, who write to ORCID records. So it's really, um, that's where the biggest uptake your, your students and your researchers will find when they submit a manuscript. There's sometimes a requirement like uh, Nature requires uh, an ORCID ID to submit. And then when it's published, Nature will write that citation to the ORCID record. Um, but then also recognize the authors. Um, and then second to that are the funding agencies. They're really coming up and coming on strong with the ORCID requirements as well. Um, they're, the open research infrastructure is just, it's, it's blossoming and it's just so interesting what's happening. Uh, the funders are now gonna have unique IDs for each fund that they award and they're gonna be able to track who they gave it to and what the publication outcomes are of that research award. And so that, that whole infrastructure has been envisioned as being built right now. So if you wanna prepare your graduate students for this blossoming world, um, then uh, you know, having, uh, encouraging uh, you know, ORCID IDs is a great way to prepare them for success. Wonderful, thank you. We have a, uh, a question. So why do you say students embargo if they plan to publish? Well, I can, I can take a stab at that and then um, have others respond also. Uh, students embargo their work because they want to protect it 
um, hopefully just temporarily, um, from others accessing it because they want to get credit for their own work. Um, that's, that's, I think, the simple answer. And then they, after they publish um, in a journal or um, in a textbook or a novel or however they intend to publish, then they can um, release the embargo. Would you like to speak to that, Shauna? Or Kelly or anyone else? I can say something about that. For us, um, students are embargoing if they plan to publish because their department is telling them that they can't publish unless they embargo, which is not true. Right. Uh, a few publishers, sure, might feel queasy about that, but most, no, you can put a preprint up. You're not gonna publish your dissertation as is. It's always gonna be a preprint. Um, but that's fine. There are a few publishers who are still a little wonky about that and they, you know, they'll ask you to take it down. So, um, but you can always just take it down if you put it up too <laughs> without an embargo. Um, as far as protecting it, it's less of that. So ours come with the copyright, clear copyright, and you can also put in um, a rights statement, like a, a use, like a license if you want to. So I think we're less worried about somebody stealing it um, because it has the copyright right there on it um, than we are um, whether or not a publisher's happy with a preprint being up. Thank you for that clarification. We have a couple of more minutes. Um, there's a question, when we're speaking of publishing, are we talking about availability through open access or to a specific repository, et cetera? Um, when we're talking about publishing, we're talking about students who are planning to publish in a journal mm -hmm. or as a book or whatever they're planning to do. They are, I, I'm publishing it to the institutional repository, but mm -hmm. the students may, and what we're finding is there's been a big push in our history department to, even away from the dissertation, to have students instead publish in journals. Um, they are still writing some dissertations, but really we're seeing our dissertations are just full of pre-published material. So that's really been the push. Mm -hmm. Any last comments? We have Cynthia, just another I, minute. Yes, there's please. one other question. Our, um, I get somebody mentioned here, anonymous. Um, if you register a DOI, a digital object identifier, and you included ORCID when registering, then the ORCID profile can easily have the ETD added to it via Crossref or data site. So thank you. Uh, Crossref and data site are our sister organizations. We work closely with them and we do um, enable interoperability. And so if you just Google ORCID and data site, um, you'll see how you can connect um, your ORCID ID to your data site. And so uh, when a DOI is issued, it's automatically written to your ORCID record. So again, it keeps the data consistent and uh, nicely connected. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, and I, I um, request you just direct that to um, Kelly directly. And uh, because we do need to wrap up and I wanna thank the presenters for a compelling presentation. Thank you very much. And all of you who um, attended, I hope you learned as much as I did. <laughs>